like to uh, welcome everybody to the Cumberland uh, Town Council uh, meeting of um, October, uh, February 8th. Oh, there goes the microphone. So um, I, I, w I want to say before I, I get going here, welcome to our new digs. And uh, they, it, it came out really, really nice. I, and Brenda, I must, I must admit that everybody that I've talked to likes the color. <laughs> so the first item is the approval of the, uh, the minutes of uh, January 25th, 2021. Do we have a motion? I'm not going to move. Shirley, thank yeah. you. Do we have a second? Ron, a second. Discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, Brenda. Mike is uh, on, uh, he's actually on quarantine right now, so he's not going to be with us tonight. Take care of yourself, Mike. The uh, next item is uh, manager's report, Bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it is my privilege and pleasure tonight to uh, introduce our state representative, Steve Moriarty, who is here tonight to give you an update. And uh, once he is complete, I have a couple of other items for the council. So, Steve, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Bill. Good evening, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Steve Moriarty from 12 Oak Street here in Cumberland. And congratulations on your renovations. This is really uh, impressive. It's my first time here uh, after dark. Next time I may bring my sunglasses, but uh, <laughs> it's really very nice. You're going to be very uh, uh, comfortable here, I'm sure, and it looks terrific for the public. Well, the last time I was here was probably December, and I said I would come by periodically and let you know what's going on for the legislature. January was not all that active a month, relatively speaking, but things are really starting to crank up now, and so it's a good time to come back. Um, the first thing I want to emphasize is that this is an extraordinarily unusual year for the legislature, as it probably is for every other business or enterprise or undertaking of, of any type. We are, in fact, in session, but we have not been together as a body since December 2nd, on the day we were sworn in at the Augusta Civic Center. Um, after the swearing in, what happens, what happened this year is the same as what happens every year. There's a period of several weeks in which legislators submit bills that they want to have considered in the upcoming session, and they, over a period of time, they get them, they get them back from the revisor's office and so forth, and seek out sponsors, and all of that happened as it ordinarily does, although electronically, this time around. It isn't until the first of the year, in a general, when things are normal, that the legislature generally gets back into session at the state house. But in January, when you're in session, all you're really doing is referring bills to one of the 17 joint standing committees for their consideration. You don't really do anything substantive because there are no bills that have been placed before you yet. So we're right on schedule as we would be in a normal year, but in an entirely different uh, setting with different formats for communicating. So as you probably know, but I'll just review quickly, when bills are, are filed and they're approved in, in, in the final form, they're put out by the revisor's office and they must be assigned to one of the 17 joint standing committees, the, the committee whose, whose job or book of business most closely corresponds to the bill in question. Then the committee has a public hearing, then they have a work session, and eventually at some point down the road, they vote the bill out with a recommendation to adopt or, or <coughs> enact, a recommendation against it, or a recommendation to uh, enact it with an amendment or two, sometimes in the form of a completely replaced bill, all of which takes a lot of time. And what the leaders basically of the legislature, both parties discovered or, or, or realized starting in November was that 
we really didn't have to get together, as we ordinarily do in January, to forward bills to committee. That could be done by the leadership uh, personnel themselves. And so that's what happened. Uh, uh, an assignment of, of a bill could be challenged if it was felt to be sent to the inappropriate committee, but that, that didn't happen this time around, and, didn't, and I didn't really think it would. So uh, we are looking at, according to uh, information I obtained this morning, about 1,900 bills, mm -hmm. not all of which by any means have yet been put out by the revisor's office. There's a lot yet to come. The 1,900 may winnow down two or 300 because there's a lot of duplicate bills that inevitably are filed and some will get dropped. But I'm happy to say that last week for the first time the various committees began holding public hearings on the bills assigned to them. So that process is underway and it's gonna have to pick up uh, really quickly. I, my committee, for example, is scheduled to meet two days a week. Starting next week, it's gonna be three and then not too far beyond that four days. Uh, and eventually when you get toward the end, five. Um, public hearings are, are time consuming. You're generally talking an hour to an hour and a half or more, even on things which are fairly uh, routine. Um, last week we had public hearings on, uh, on just two bills and we're expecting over 200 to be assigned to my committee by the time this, this process is done. So things are in fact beginning to work their way through the system. One question you very likely have is, well, when are you going to come back as a group and start voting on some of the bills that have been worked on by committee and, and approved or, or uh, 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 sent to you through the committee process? The answer is nobody knows yet. No date has been set. It'll depend upon how much uh, accumulated work um, has piled up from the committees and when it's appropriate to, uh, to come back. I suspect it's probably gonna have to be um, March, uh, probably early March, uh, and, uh, maybe toward the middle of the month possibly, but it can't really, you can't really get too much further beyond that point, in my opinion, before you actually have to start voting on the accumulated legislation because the session only lasts until the end of, uh, the end of June, and there's a lot of stuff out there to be done with 1,900 likely bills. Um, the committees are all meeting, but they meet remotely on Zoom. So I do all of my legislating from the room above my garage, <laughs> uh, and I'm the only guy in the room. <laughs> but I'm looking at the faces of all the other people on my committee and the witnesses who come to hearings and so forth, and. We do get tons of emails and other sort of input, uh, reports, opinions, uh, people supporting this or opposing that, whatever the case might be. So the work really pretty closely resembles what it would be in normal times, except there's people on my committee I've never personally or physically met. And the same is true for throughout the legislature. A lot of new folks were elected this past fall, for example, and a lot of veterans were termed out. And it's gonna be a while before we get together in a committee room. If in fact we ever do, the rooms are not that large. And as long as we are medically in the situation in which we, we still are, we may not be able to safely meet. But it's taking place electronically. And um, we're seeing some of what many, many towns and cities are reporting around the state in that with remote participation capability, you're getting a higher percentage of the public taking part than you ordinarily do in non-pandemic times. For example, when we had, uh, as the legislature has always had, in-person hearings and people testifying in person, some people, for some people it was a four hour drive one way. And then a lot of time spent waiting a lot of time spent in the hearing and then turn around and go home. Now they can just do it by following the electronic format. And so it's really opening things up in a way that we've uh, never seen before. It also makes for somewhat longer hearings, <coughs> but that's, that's okay. The more engagement you get, the better, the, 
better the product, the better the quality of your knowledge and insight on the particular issue. So um, no committee, to my knowledge yet, has reported out any bills. It's a little early for that to happen, but you will begin to see that happen by the end of this month. And then uh, they will accumulate to a certain, the, the bills reported out, as I mentioned, will accumulate to a certain number when the leadership will determine, well, we better get the whole group together again and start voting on some of these bills to, to keep pace. Um, so that's, in a nutshell, the way things are, are taking place these days. We're in session, except we don't meet. We hold committee hearings, except we're scattered among 13 different locations because there are 13 people on every committee. And it's strange. Um, but I've learned how to Zoom, and uh, which means that anybody can learn it, I guess. <laughs> and it works. Uh, the technological people or the IT people up at the State House have done an amazing job in pulling this all together. Uh, and it's it just it works remarkably well. Um, last week, in addition to my two committee hearings, two of my bills had their first hearing before different committees. So I got to testify in support of a couple of my bills remotely. A different kind of experience. Usually you're there in person at a podium much like this, making your pitch, making the eye contact, gauging people's reactions. Not quite, doesn't quite work that way uh, on Zoom, but still you get your point across and your point is made and, and Anybody who wants to tune in, uh, either live or watch it on YouTube at some other time or whatever, can do so. So that's how we're doing business right now. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions. It's a bit early to know which way the winds are blowing procedurally and substantively, but it is, in fact, working. Thanks. Steve, you mentioned you had two bills. First of all, you're missed on the planning board. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> okay, uh, but you said there was you had two bills that that you were working on. Can you well, tell us what they two, are? Two, two of I've, I've submitted I think eight or nine, but the first two were scheduled for hearing last week. Okay. And uh, there was a letter that or something that came out today on the internet by Kathy Breen about the scams that are happening. The what now? The scams related to, uh, um, I guess, uh, situations where people are being scammed to uh, get, get misinformation. Can you add anything to that? I haven't seen that yet, personally. Okay. okay. Shirley, I think you might have seen that. I th yeah, I think I saw it on the news, too, at noon today when okay. Josh was watching. Um, it has to do with gift cards, business, someone okay. calls, okay. calling and saying, they're so and so from a local business, and and they want photographs of the gift cards. Yeah, mm. really, and it's a, it's a scam. Mm. Huh. Okay. Bob, Steve, we talked back in uh, December, you and I, about uh, a couple of items, and uh, so w the uh, one that I'm going to bring up this evening is uh, public uh, community input on. Leasing of waterfront, uh, uh, oceanfront uh, property for agriculture. Is there any bills that have been put forward uh, to uh, address that? I don't know if any bill, well, probably so. And I say, I say probably, Bob, because not all of the bills that people submitted in November and December have come out of the revisor's office. So there's a lot out there that, and they're not accessible even to me if they haven't been put out by the revisor. So there's a lot of stuff that we haven't yet seen. Of the stuff they've put out, I don't know that I've seen a bill yet, but I understand that the Department of Marine Resources is working on some rule changes and applications through its administrative function and is continuing to process applications, uh, probably remotely, but I think they're, they're keeping pace with that demand, which is growing. Um, I, I did part. I took part in a, a Zoom uh, presentation last week, put on by the Maine Development Foundation, and um, there was.
is one presenter who is in the aquaculture business, uh, specifically seaweed harvesting, who did an amazing job in, in telling all of us who were participating what an Im incredible market there is and can will be for Maine seaweed mm -hmm. in the future. She said, among other things, we have a coastline that's longer than California's. And this pro the, the, the material in the, in the in seaweed can be processed into various food additives and food itself. And there's a huge market out there just waiting for this stuff to uh, you know, become available. So we, we fished out all the fish. <laughs> so now we're going to fish out all the seaweed. It's <laughs> well, the, they talked about seeding plans as well, so as to make sure that it keeps on growing. And we didn't get into the specifics because there was a lot of other people had things to say as well. But so with the aquaculture is a sort of a, a big a big thing right now. As Bill will will tell you here locally. Any other questions, uh, Steve? No, I'm Steve. Going. Tom. Steve. Yes, George. Steve, I know the Maine Municipal Association um, basically makes recommendations to the various committees having to do with whether a bill should pass or not and so on. I'm just wondering how persuasive are they most of the time or are they uh, just anecdotal? You know, they're, uh, they're one of the uh, uh, frequent flyers, so to speak, uh, before committees of the, le of the legislature and they're, uh, I think, very, very highly regarded, their, their opinion. Uh, you know, back when I was in the council, I served on the uh, Legislative Policy Committee of the MMA, and you may have too. Yeah, I did. I thought so, yeah. Yeah, so th that, that there's 70 people in that committee from all over the state, two from each senatorial district, and so they distill out their position in response to municipally related bills, and then one of the lead people from the MMA will appear before the assigned committee and say, this is our position based upon uh, our membership, and it, it, it's got a lot of impact. It really means a lot. In fact, they testified on one of my bills last week in, in support, so I appreciated right. that. Allison, Ron, anything? Uh, Steve? I hope you'll come to me with questions as they arise, and I'll we get back to you in, in a few weeks, hopefully with more to tell, more to talk about. Uh, but I just want to assure you that strange as it is, and strange as it may be to read about this stuff, the way it's happening, it is in fact taking place, and, and it's, it's working. It's just that we're not coming together. Yes. I should say getting together. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Steve, thank you so much. Okay, Tom, really appreciate welcome. the update. Thank very you so welcome. much. Thanks very much. Mr. Town Manager. Just two quick other announcements. Um, I was going to uh, update the council on the brown tail moth. Um, uh, of course, uh, Cumberland is the only town in Cumberland County that has any type of infestation, and it's along its northwesterly borders. Um, I have asked uh, uh, Dave McDonald from Whitney Tree to look into that area. I sent him the same map that you guys got in, in your packets. Uh, he went out and inspected it to see if the road type spraying that we've done in the past would be effective. His reply today to me is that he did not feel it would be effective at all. Um, I'm still waiting for the state entomologist to uh, get together with uh, me and just uh, explain if there's anything really people can do. Um, when, it's, when it's really not in the roads and it's back in the woods, uh, we can't reach it unless it's by aerial or, <coughs> or uh, individual homes can ground spray. But uh, right now we have no uh, budget for it or no plans at this time. <coughs> I will wait to hear from the state entomologist to get back to you with uh, additional information. But uh, the map that they published that you had in your packet, uh, it's, it's you know, discouraging that it's still us. <laughs> But it's moved uh, in a very weird direction. It looks like it's out toward uh, the Knights Pond area of Greeley Road Extension and that way in, in Allison's backyard. So uh, it's really funny how it kind of shifted from being focused right on the four side for years and then it just, just took off. And we're hearing complaints all around town. Now, people have to understand brown tail moths exist in nature 
forever. I mean, they don't go away. They just, when they have these outbreaks and infestations, that's when they become un uncontrollable. And we've had them essentially on a 10 to 12 year cycle every 10 to 12 years. So uh, they seem to last for about five to six years. They go away and then they come back, you know, for uh, again uh, with a vengeance. But uh, we'll keep you posted and I'll get back to you as soon as I hear from the state. Uh, the last item, I just received a text while we were here tonight uh, that the uh, Cumberland Fairgrounds was awarded uh, 56 racing dates uh, uh, for this upcoming race season. And uh, we should probably hear more from um, the uh, fairgrounds and the Farmers Club uh, in the near future. But uh, my understanding is those dates will be uh, uh, daytime racing. Uh, they have some issues with the lights up there, so all the races will be held in the day. And uh, I think it'll be a good thing for the fairgrounds. And I think they'll try to match those up with other events that are going there to try to bring uh, additional people to the uh, fairgrounds over the course of the summer. But um, I'm hopeful that we'll see uh, somebody from the fairgrounds fairly soon uh, because those will require mass gathering as they're going to be pretty close to 500 people. So uh, those will require mass gathering from you and hopefully we'll get more details at the time. So I'll keep you posted on that as well. And that is all I have for right now, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Phil. Uh, by the way, uh, when you were gone uh, last two weeks ago, uh, Chris did a terrific job. So if you can pass that on to him, I'd appreciate it. I will, thank you. And I even said uh, Bill Who, so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I, I'd Bob. like to uh, <laughs> I'd like to question the town manager on an issue, and I maybe I thought about doing it in, on a new business, but I think it might be appropriate to okay. do it now. Uh, and, and particularly if there's somebody watching at home, they might uh, catch this early on. I'm concerned with the process of a new school being built and if wonder before I make any comments you might want to share with us what you know about it uh, sure uh, last week I believe or maybe the same night that you met the school board met uh, to discuss building a land uh, building a new school uh, 68,000 square foot school on land uh, adjacent to let's say let's call it the superintendent's office uh, uh, Joe Campbell, who's the landowner, has, uh, I believe they have a, a purchase and sale agreement to buy both his parcels, which is probably just about two and a half acres, plus or minus. Uh, that, that would be kind of almost directly across from the uh, Performing Arts Center. Uh, that land is a very nice piece of property. It has a, a very large house on it right now that uh, some have interest in moving to another nearby parcel. Uh, so. Uh, the school has uh, done a conceptual layout plan with their architect. Uh, they hired an architect a while ago to just kind of give them some feedback on the layouts of what could work and where. Uh, they are, uh, I think the board uh, supported the plan to move forward and I believe we'll see more plans uh, over the next month or so. Um, I've reached out to Jeff, to uh, Jeff Porter, the superintendent, to uh, bring it to the council so you could see you know what was happening and that uh, probably will happen in the next month or so so uh, there are no costs yet uh, that have been put together obviously because of the land development and stuff I mean anybody can take 68,000 square feet and multiply by a number but that number as most of you know that uh, construction costs have gone up significantly as have uh, building materials so uh, that can be all over the place right now, and they're trying to nail that number down before they go public with it. But uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it fits. It fits on the site. The, uh, the work would require the existing Sweetser house uh, to be uh, moved or, or basically demolished. It's, it's not going to fit there. Uh, there'll be parking that would probably have to take its place for the new school and uh, some of the grading issues uh, would make it difficult to keep the school there. So whether it's moved on on-site or off-site, I don't know. Um, I know that they were going to reach out to, to the historical society to see if uh, there was somebody locally that would you know, want to preserve the building. But remember, the building of the Sweetser House itself or the school part of it is really just the front half of it. Years ago, they put a big addition off the back of it that really doesn't have a lot of historical uh, meaning to it. 
it's kind of hard because my, my kids went to kindergarten there, so it's kind of different <laughs> when you look at it. I went to kindergarten there. there. Ron went to kindergarten yeah. there. You know, Mike went to kindergarten there. Pretty, it's pretty cool. I mean, so I, I hope it can be preserved, but having gone through what we just did with the uh, uh, Historical Society building, it's, uh, it's a, an expensive undertaking. But uh, So more to come. That's all the news I have, so don't shoot the messenger, please. So uh, that's, that's where they're at at this point. I think uh, Shirley and I discussed this the other day. I think she hit it right on the head. It's, it's almost like their town garage. I mean, our, what we went through with the town garage trying to relocate it, they have gone through with trying to find a home for this school, and they've been all over the place. So um, I think they're to a point now, if they can keep the campus model, uh, they're going to move in that direction. <coughs> Any timeline on the referendum? Uh, it's going to be difficult because a lot of that is dictated by state law and uh, they have to form a building committee and they have to do a lot of things that take time and I don't believe they're going to be ready for the November election so it could be a special election uh, perhaps as early as January or February of 2022 so uh, it probably will happen in the next year I don't think it'll be as late as a year from June but it's it's in that January to June time frame right now. Thanks, Bill. Shirley. Uh, follow up is the purchase and sale agreement. Does it have a clause contingent on the acceptance of a school by referendum? Yes, it's uh, 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 Mr. Campbell is not in a big hurry, so okay. he was very a very uh, agreeable um, uh, you know seller, if you will. Uh, he give him time to look for another residence, and he knows it's it's all subject to referendum. Okay. And without that, nothing happens. Okay. Bob, anything else? I have to uh, voice my strong disapproval of of this project going forward. It's it's an acre and a half building, you know, sixty eight thousand square feet. It's, yeah. it's an acre and a half. It's it's we have a congestion issue in the town right now and to, to further exasperate that by putting another building on that campus is, is, is short-sighted at best. This is, this is, to me, this stands out as a classic example of the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing and a lack of communication between the school board and the communities that they're hanging out in and, and taking our tax dollars from. I'd like to see a list of the properties of every property in this town that's been reviewed and a letter from the, the property owner saying, I have no interest in selling the piece of property. I can think of at least 15 properties where we could cite a school on in the towns of Cumberland and North Yarmouth. Uh, just as an example, Fred Kenny's piece of property on, on Blanchard Road. It, has anyone approached Fred Kenny and, and had Fred Kenny say, I'm not interested in selling? I want to see that kind of homework done before we just throw another school I I into a congested piece of property in a in a in a con in the center of our town. It, it's 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 poor urban planning. Uh, we're looking at a school with a, with a, a minimum of a 50-year uh, life. Uh, where's the studies that show where our growth of of residential housing is going to occur in the next 50 years? And why are we not citing a school where there is going to be a growth area? If you, if you drive up the street to North Yarmouth and you look at the growth going on up there, it stands to reason that that's where the town should be, the school district should be citing a new school. And there is plenty of land available up there. I, I just add a, it, it is frustrating to think that we have an entity that can move ahead with spending 40, 50, 60 million dollars with so little imp input and so little impact and, and, and engineering studies to go in behind it. So um, I'm well, not asking anybody I, I to think I just would say that some of that criticism is unfair because uh, they have worked really hard to find other sites. Um, for instance, uh, Brad Hilton, uh, over 30 acres of land up there that would have been a, a really interesting campus because it, but, it butts our property and that would have been a really cool place for a school but they were outbid on that property uh, they have put out an rfp uh, twice to 
ask for folks to come forward to uh, if they were interested in just interested in having a discussion to uh, maybe perhaps sell some land to relocate the school so it's not and this is why I think Shirley's comments uh, with when in my discussion with her the other day were right on target. I mean, they're going through the same thing we went through trying to find a new home for a garage. People like schools better than they like municipal facilities, but still it's been difficult. And I, I hear exactly what you're saying, but I, to, I totally understand what they're going through because it, it is not easy to get somebody to you know, work with you and then you know, get the rug pulled out from under you when you think you had a really good plan they had a plan on that 32 acres that uh, Brad had uh, that would have been exactly what you're talking about it would have been a great campus and they were very excited about it but uh, when it came up for sale it was gone to a, another bidder and that's that's the reality in Cumberland today land is very very difficult uh, North Yarmouth has tried uh, they were you know basically I think told that you know they didn't have people that had the appetite to locate a school there or didn't want to locate it uh, you know, on property that uh, you know could be closer to the center of North Yarmouth. So um, it's not because of a lack of interest and they have called and reached out and we have worked really hard with them to help them through that process with costs and locations and entrances and drainage and all kinds of the preliminary things that they didn't have to spend a ton of money on to get to this spot. But I think they've gotten to a place where uh, this is the first willing buyer they've had in well over a year in their in their search. It's it's just adding more and more to that that spot, though. And it, it no, I'm not I'm not disagreeing that the it is a tight spot and that is it, you know I wish it was ten acres and not you know two two and a quarter acres. I really wish I really wish they had that. And not to offend the residents <laughs> on Turkey Lane, but Medley Watson's land is is a flat field. There, there's just there are just other avenues to explore and, I, and I'd <coughs> encourage you know maybe uh, the superintendent and, and Peter Bingham who's kind of led that charge on that group to come in and just so sh they could share with you what they have been through and it isn't it isn't because of a lack of effort and and Peter especially I'm like gosh he has asked me a hundred different questions about land in town and he has he has too reached out to people personally and the interest level just hasn't been there. I don't know what to, what to say. One thing that I'm going to say in support of this uh, proposal uh, is that uh, it's one campus. And that, that means an awful lot to many people, especially the residents, the, the, not, not the resi with the residents of Cumberland. That they, they're not going back and forth all over the place to drop off the kids. So. That has a lot to do with it. So right now, I'm kind of supportive of it. George, anything? Well, I, I just, uh, just want to correct Bill to a very minor extent on the Hilton property in that um, I was intimate with it because I had it listed. And uh, um, Hilton was encouraged to give the school a proposal which appeared to be the, the proposal that he gave the school without getting into detail appeared to be ludicrous. Um, the asking price on the property had been 900000 and um, but this, I just wanted to clarify, Bill, the school had an opportunity, admittedly, it would have been, from their point of view, outlandish, but the fact is that a party came along and paid exactly what Hilton was asking for um, and pledging to keep the trails intact and to keep it just exactly the way Brad would have wanted and his wife would have wanted. So uh, that's the way that evolved. And uh, But in support of what you're saying, the school... Uh, did do some preliminary work on it and uh, basically didn't make a decision and before they came across a decision the decision had been made for them. Right. So. And, and that's the real difficulty is that the decisions can't be as instantaneously as a private landowner uh, or a private buyer. You and I could make a decision as, a, as an individual but 
the school has to go back to a committee and has to do a lot more than we have to do. All right. Ron, you got anything? No. no. Allison? No. Now that you brought the uh, brown tail moss back. So I know. Single-handedly. <laughs> All yours fault. <laughs> okay, the next item is public discussion. Public discussion is for comments on items that are not on the agenda. Comments are limited to five minutes per person. Rebuttal comments are subject, will be uh, uh, limited to two minutes. Public discussion will be brought up again, could be brought up again um, under new business for further uh, council action. Do we have anybody for public discussion? Mark, since you're the only one here, <laughs> you got anything? <laughs> okay, thank you. All righty. Since we have nobody for public discussion, um, we're going to move on. The next item is legislation and policy. The next the item is to hold a public hearing and act on amendments to Chapter 84, uh, Fees and Fines, Section 32, Yard Waste Facility of the Cumberland Code as recommended by the, the Ordinance Committee. Bill, you want to take this? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'll do it from the podium only because it's uh, I've got the, uh, the slide up on the television. So um, our yard waste facility uh, basically has what I've found out to be two types of users. Um, kind of the person that comes once a year for a spring cleanup or a fall cleanup and then they have the um, habitual every Saturday I want to meet my friends there <laughs> type of users, which is okay. So there are folks that really like the facility and there are folks that just need it once a year. What we received for criticism to date, and it's, it, was, it was real, is that the cost of a, a, that one day pass that we used to have that we eliminated uh, was pretty affordable for a person that just wanted to come once and just clean up his yard and be done, like to get the one day pass because they could make multiple trips and didn't have to worry about it. And uh, when we eliminated it, we really caused that person to uh, go out and buy uh, either multiple trip passes, which we don't sell very many of. This is the one that I'm showing here is uh, the $5 per load that used to be and now it would be 10 very few of these passes are ever sold. The biggest pass we have is the one day pass and that used to be $10 and I basically un undid it. So tonight if you are, um, if, it, if it's your desire to you know, continue this discussion and to let more people maybe uh, uh, react and reach out or, or figure out a way to get the message out, uh, because a lot of people, when they see a you know the uh, fees and fines chapter being up today, they don't care. <laughs> they they really care about the yard waste facility and how do they get it, how much is, how it's going to impact their brush and you know what it's going to do. So um, we were talking today as staff. I, I reached out to Chris and to uh, Laura both, and they basically said uh, the most popular pass is the one day pass. So if you guys could focus your energy around that. And maybe, like Ron was saying in the initial conversations, that those trailer dumps and rack body trucks that really have a lot of volume, maybe those are a little bit higher for the one-day pass. Instead of per load, uh, we go to a $25 day pass and a 15 for the cars with the small trailers and the, and the, small, the regular size pickup trucks might be 15. Um, everybody involved with the facility on my side of the fence uh, basically felt that was a much better use, and this, cate this category of the $10 per load is, you know, a handful of tickets sold. If we were going to eliminate any category, they said that might be the best category to eliminate. And then we got into the commercial passes, and um, there are a lot of people that can't do their own work. So if they have a commercial company come in that are going to use the facility, um, the day pass for a commercial vendor, $100 would probably be a good thing. We got the material here. It's not cast somewhere on the side street somewhere because somebody couldn't afford to dump it. 
Uh, but then that same commercial person would probably have multiple accounts and might use the facility three to four times. So the $500 pass might be worth it, uh, especially um, with our extended season. And then I just threw the small dump trucks on there, the, the, the dump trucks that are, I don't know, Ron, or I, I guess I'd classify them at 38,000 pounds or something like that. I don't really know how to. So you, you and I were on a different page. You were thinking it was a one ton because it had right. six wheels. I was thinking it was a town plow truck because it has six wheels. They both have six wheels, but both are very, very different vehicles. One is about a seven or eight yard capacity, and the other one's about half that. So I'm kind of struggling with the wording on this one. So those were the two categories we came up with, and we thought that it would be cleaner if we just presented it that way. But um, I said, you know, the council hasn't seen that. They basically saw the uh, something a little bit different. Uh, they, they saw the elimination of the day pass, which I didn't realize was the most popular pass we had. So um, looking for some feedback of what you'd like to do tonight. Uh, personally, we're not opening until April 1st, so there is not a huge rush for this. Uh, we could do it and approve it tonight and then approve it again in next month if you wanted to. But um, I'm just throwing these ideas out there. Um, the, other, the other thing we talked about was the uh, hours of operation. Uh, right now, we basically, we really open in April, and sometimes we've opened in March, they've told me. So it's really April um, that we're opening. And so what we proposed for regular hours, uh, which would be, um, uh, let's go to the extended hours, because that's how we start the season. And maybe if I reverse these blocks, they would make more sense. So we open sometime in April. And the busy part of our, our time there is typically in May. That's when people really get excited, and really right up until late, uh, Memorial Day, they really go uh, guns a-blazing. And maybe the first weekend in June, that's when it starts to die off. So my proposal is perhaps to uh, go to the second Saturday in June from the time we open, and then again in October um, and November. That would be those two sections where we'd have extended hours. And the extended hours are really Saturdays. Saturdays from 9 to 3. That's really what it is. We're only open till 12.30 the rest of the year. And honestly, because there's nobody that shows up in the afternoons, uh, typically in, uh, uh, the end in June for the most part, uh, July and August, and even September, we don't get a lot of users. And the fall, really, it's uh, closer to November when it really starts to pick up. So we adjusted the, the uh, timing a little bit to show the April start date. Um, Laura Nolesky and I had a really good conversation today because she is the captain of the javelin catching team. She answers all the phone calls of people that call and are upset about things related to uh, what we do on the public services side. Um, she said her biggest complaint was the loss of the day pass and um, putting up there that we opened in May when we really have always opened in April. So that was not intentional. We are not planning to open later. We just planning to say, you know, we'll open as soon as we can uh, once the winter has kind of uh, let its grip off of us, and then uh, we'll plan on closing um, uh, in November. So that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. It's not, uh, it's not a lot different than you've seen before other than adding the April instead of May here. And then uh, the fees, I think, are the real, um, are the real change that uh, we're bringing forward to you guys tonight. And we don't mean to change this up, but – uh, we haven't received any feedback until this week, and the feedback we we got was really good. Uh, you know, person said, "Look, I don't really want to buy a season pass. I'm only going to use it once a year for my yard cleanup. I got a small yard, and this was one of the few things I really like to do. It seems like, you know, you're punishing me for that one day, and I really don't want to spend that much on a on a pass." So. You know, we heard it, and uh, we said, well, let's carry the message and see what the, the council has to say. So, Bill, what are you suggesting that we do at this time? Uh, honestly, I think you can go forward with this. I think it might get tweaked a little bit unless you guys have some, some real changes here. I think the day pass should be kept. I think if we go with a residential pass at $15 and, you know, keep the commercial operators out of there because they'll all buy them. Uh, but encourage the commercial pass to also, you know, you know, look at the day pass because they may be working at a um, at a residence that might take the entire day to uh, to clean up, and that's 
cost is going to be built into the bill to the homeowner. So let's let's try to be reasonable, and we're glad it's coming to the facility because we're making you know, compost and materials, and and we're managing our solid waste in a very responsible way. Um, I think it works. I, I think the facility is large enough to accommodate this, and I believe um, you know I believe the the single load pass is kind of a I don't know. To me, two two loads, and you've already you've you paid for the uh, one day pass. And most people aren't going <coughs> to come up with a half a truckload. They'll basically give it to their neighbor to bring up or something like that. So, thanks, Mike. Shirley. First of all, I'd like to thank Allison for highlighting this. Allison and Ron highlighted it in the in the uh, new and updated council, you know, council corner. corner of the uh, <laughs> Cumberland Crier, so thanks. And that might be why you got some feedback. Yep. Um, I did have a couple of questions. Just want um, commercial passes. Those are for Cumberland, resi Cumberland residences only. Do we have that written anywhere? Yeah, Cumberland Yard Waste Only. It's right here next to this one. This oh, one, there this it one is. Was new there today. it is, okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So the other thought I had, just um, you wondered about switching those columns around, and I wondered if you switched the switched the columns around and called them regular hours and summer hours, because that's what we do at the library. We have regular library hours, and then we have summer library hours. It's yeah. just a it's yeah. There are probably lots of ways to do it, but that's what came to mind first. Yeah, that'd be true because the regular, the summer hours would be the abbreviated hours and everything else would be the, you know, the extended. The regular yeah. hours. Yeah. So, yeah, good idea. And it, it is during the summer, you know, by September, it's not summer anymore. And so through September, so we'll call those the summer hours. I like it. And we'll call these the regular hours. Right. New, the new regular hour. Yeah. Right. Good pick up, Shirley. Thank you. That's why she's a teacher. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bob? I think we should have uh, two, two additional lines in here uh, for the day passes, one for uh, uh, cars, pickups, trucks, single axle trailers, and then uh, the other one for the rack body, one-ton dumps and, and dump trailers. I think there should be a, a day fee. That we have those right here. C and D is exactly that, Bob. C is the rack body trucks, one ton dump trucks and dump trailers. That's $25 per day. That's for a full day pass. And the cars, pickup trucks with smaller trailers, non-dump trailers would be $15 a day. So they'd I be don't have that on my. Yeah, you, you don't, don't, you don't. This is okay. brand new. This is absolutely brand new. You don't have that in your packet. So my bad. This kind of happened all afternoon when uh, Laura came up to me and said, you know, I really, I've been getting calls about this. and. Uh, I haven't given you the feedback, and she gave me the feedback this afternoon, knowing I was coming here tonight. So, well, I I support adding that in then. Good. And and honestly, it's so easy to change. It's one council meeting. Yeah. Right. Allison. Just an an so the the seven wheeled seven yard dump truck in our council packet had seventy five per load, but you have fifty there. Was that a purposeful change? Uh, it, it was okay. um, primarily because um, when we had the day pass at 100, okay. it would encourage people to that, even with those larger vehicles, to buy the day pass so that, you know, if it's one and a half loads or two loads, it'd be a lot easier. But but some people just have one, yep. you know, okay. one load. I just wanted to make sure that was purposeful. Yeah. And, and Chris and I uh, talked tonight, the, the <coughs> assistant town manager, and yeah, his feeling was that uh, we're trying to encourage the use of the facility. You know, it was built by all taxpayers, and you know, just because they don't have a pickup truck or a vehicle to bring it over, and if they have a lot of yard work and somebody has a small truck that they can rent, you know, it's all, it works to our advantage. It doesn't show up at the woods. It doesn't show up in a parking lot somewhere. It all comes into the facility, and it's, it's we've been very, very fortunate. Uh, with uh, very, very little backyard dumping in areas that we don't want it to go. George, do you have anything? No. Nope. Ron? Looks fine to me. I know I've received positive feedback, like just personally, from folks that saw it in the crier and then took it out, or checked it out and were 
the extended hours were much appreciated and had no problem paying more, you know, even at $40 was clearly a value for a season pass or the day pass. So, but it, your the changes and they make sense to me. So, and, and Ron, I'm still stuck on the small dump trucks. I, I just don't know what it, what's a better way to classify that. I just am stuck. When, you, when you register a vehicle, 26,000 pounds is a magic number. So I don't know if you want to use that, but then you want to open everybody's door to check, see what the GVW of a vehicle is. I mean, that's <laughs> not going to work either. I really don't know, Bill. I mean, the only thing maybe is anything larger than a one ton will be a certain fee. Don't classify it. Just say anything larger than a one ton. Like your truck, Bob, I consider a one ton. But I mean, the town plow trucks obviously are a two ton or a two and a quarter ton vehicle. So I would almost classify it anything larger than a one ton is this fee, I mean. Yeah, because most of them are gonna have the rack bodies and probably the ton and a halfs and right, the two ton right. trucks that are much larger in capacity to carry more. Right. Especially if they're using it as a dump truck, it's a lot more versatile than a dump truck. Yeah. But I look around in the summer and people having yard work done, a lot of these local people have, like, uh, the arsenal boy, boy, man, he's only a year younger than me, I think. He has a small dump truck. He drives around mows lawns and then bags it and then dumps it in yeah. his dump truck. Which is a one ton. It's a one ton, yeah. yeah. Yep. Michael Story's trucks, he has one Hino that's bigger than a one ton, but everything else he has is a one ton, so. Yeah. I mean, okay. and I'm sure Michael, if he sees this, he's going to use his one ton <laughs> as opposed to the Hino, you know, because yeah. he knows he's going to yeah. save some money. Yeah. So. Any other discussion by the council? I'm going to open up to the public hearing. Mark, you have anything? <laughs> okay. I'm going to close the public hearing, and I'm going to ask for a motion. I'll make Cheryl? I'll make the motion. Um, I move to amend Chapter 84, Fees and Fines, Section 32, Yard Waste Facility of the Cumberland Code, as recommended by the Ordinance Committee and the Town Manager. Second. We have a second. George, thank you. Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, Brenda. I guess my further discussion was um, we didn't quite get Chris's answer about the day pass, where to obtain the day pass, was slightly different than your answer about where people could get a day pass, whether they could get one at the facility or not. And Chris said he was going to have to think about it and get back to us. So um, we want to think about if someone comes to the dump on a Saturday morning, can they get a a day pass there at the dump. I, I would like to try to do that. Okay. And I'd encourage the council to allow us to do that because it's really an inconvenience to send somebody, you know, back to the you know food the food stop, stop or somewhere okay. else because okay. I just think I don't know. We'll right. let's work it out. Let's see if we can make it okay. happen. And I think that's the way All to right. go. As long as it's clear to the public. Yeah, we'll we'll figure out a way to number the passes so we can track them and we can track the revenues. It's just okay. it's really that that simple. It's kind of okay. like we did at Broad Cove this summer. We basically gave the residents the passes at Broad Cove instead of having them come up here and yeah. pay the one dollar for the. It was yeah. silly. So, so okay. okay, we'll try. We'll start out with that way, and if it becomes too problematic, we'll uh, we'll let you know. All right, good. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Next item is to authorize the town manager to execute a, a execute a lease agreement with Hyundai uh, Capital America for lease of two electric vehicles. Mr. Town Manager. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this, this came to us uh, uh, from Row Ford, and I believe most uh, Hyundai dealers are, are looking to do this and get electro uh, electric vehicles out across the state. Uh, we have been exploring the use of electric vehicles for town business. Uh, we have uh, right now 
most folks use their personal vehicles uh, to you know run errands, run to the post office, run to the bank, those type of things. And you know, at 52 cents a mile, it adds up pretty quick. <laughs> so uh, what we saw was the opportunity to at least try this to see if it would be feasible and also to encourage uh, maybe the use of electric cars by having uh, additional hookups for other electric cars in the front of town hall and put it right front and center. I, I really believe that might be the way to do it. Um, the police department has been exploring and in the next budget we'll be looking to purchase a, um, a hybrid explorer which would be uh, gas over electric. Uh, these are straight electric vehicles. So uh, one vehicle would be used uh, by the police department. Uh, we would like to see if there's a possibility for uh, the lieutenant who has a lot of meetings in court and runs back and forth and ties up a vehicle to use this vehicle. It doesn't have to be a police vehicle. I mean, we're going into Portland, so why not, you know, why spend any money on gas? <laughs> so uh, this became, when it, when it first came to me, it was $100 a, a month for the lease, and then it dropped to 50 and I think it's even less than that now with all the rebates that we're looking at. So it's kind of a no, uh, a no real cost to us. I'm sure there'll be some maintenance and upkeep over the next couple of years. But uh, for me, um, I, think, I think it's a good fit as a, I'll just call it a trial balloon. I mean, we're not buying into this long term, but we're buying into it so we can really give it a try to see if it's worth it for, um, you know, for, the, for the town hall, but also for uh, the police department in the future. You know, it's not going to be a frontline vehicle, but uh, there's a lot of stuff that we do that's really traveling from point A to point B uh, that doesn't require uh, the stuff that we have in the uh, Explorers now. So um, I haven't talked to Ron yet. Uh, Ron and I haven't had this discussion. This all came about pretty quickly, but um, it's not uh, it's not something out of the realm of uh, possibilities. The Climate Action Team, as well as the uh, Lands and Conservation Commission, have supported it uh, uh, unanimously, um, only because they believe uh, we have to take these type of steps uh, to move forward. I shared with the council that um, Eco Maine, which I sit on the, their board of director, uh, directors, uh, is where all our trash goes to a waste to energy facility. Um, they have purchased uh, through a grant, uh, through Efficiency Maine, I think, uh, two elect electric dump trucks that are half a million dollars each. They would have never been able to purchase those without some heavily subsidized grants and funding, but they too want to see it. And this is the worst environment you can actually be in. It's, it's all ash material, and that's the byproduct from the, uh, from the incinerator. And that uh, will be interesting to see how those hold up. Uh, they are having a hard time getting them because they're taking a long time to buy them, uh, to build them, but um, I think this is something that uh, we'll be looking at in the future. And as far as vehicles, vehicle, vehicles go, most of us have seen effectively the hybrids, which are the gas and electric combination. There are a lot of really positive things happening with electric vehicles right now that uh, it would be worth uh, us at least putting our toes in the water to see if this is something that fits in our fleet going forward. So but I will defer to the expert on the end about uh, his, his personal thoughts where, where we go with this. But you know, for the price, I thought it was the right, uh, the right choice. I, I was amazed that the lease was as cheap as it is. I mean, I think it's a no-brainer. The only question that I have, and it's been brought up by numerous people, is the price of the charging station. If you have a charging station in front of town hall and people with electric vehicles can use it, what about the people that show up with a diesel or the gas car? I mean, the people with the electric car are getting an advantage because they're using the charging station. And don't get me wrong, a friend of mine bought a new Tesla and I drove it a month ago now, and I was overwhelmingly impressed. I mean, it is unbelievable. I mean, there's no question in probably two years, you're going to see an influx of electric vehicles in this country. Um, the gentleman that bought that, his gas bill was about $1,400 a month because he rode around in the truck like Bob. And now his gas bill is nil, and his car payment is $700 a month. So do the math. I mean, he's, and he's a smart kid. Um, there's no question this is a wave of the future. Another thing that comes up is, well, what about the gas tax? I mean, how are we going to rebuild our highways if nobody's buying any gas? So, And that's another thing that's going to have to be dealt with. 
but that's down the road. I mean, I think for the money that you're talking here, I think it's probably a good thing to try. I mean, certainly if somebody needs to run to West Cumberland to check on something, I mean, it's a no-brainer that they can take an electric vehicle or if they have to go to Portland or to Yarmouth or to Falmouth. I mean, it, and then I think it would be an, a, a learning experience as much as anything. So the only thing that is the biggest thing is the gas tax. I mean, how are we in 20 years going to maintain our highways if nobody's buying any gas? But I'm sure that the people in Augusta, Steve left, will come up with an idea. <laughs> but I mean, I, I do think for the price of the lease, I mean, uh, I think it's probably a no-brainer. I would like to know roughly what a charging station is going to cost to put in. I mean, it, but I don't imagine that that's a whole lot of money, really. I mean, it's a 220 outlet and one and done. But Shirley? Ron, I'm sure there's no shortage of ways politicians can come up with ways to tax us. <laughs> um, I just wanted to let people know I was in a GP Cog meeting one time, and they ha actually have a couple of these vehicles that we as members of GP Cog could borrow. It just doesn't ever seem to make sense to drive to Portland to borrow a car to drive somewhere else. So um, GP Cog's been using them. Colby College has used them for quite a while for students to borrow. They've had a small fleet of, you know, five or six cars, and if a student needed to run downtown for something, they could make arrangements to, to borrow one of these, these cars. I did have a question about the lease. How long is this lease for? I think it's three a three-year lease. Okay. My other question is, you know, about when you said the word fleet, it verified my of my fear about the assumption that if the town's going to own two cars for town business then if we decide this isn't the way we want to go then are we intending to replace those with no that we're back to basically paying mileage yeah and that's what we do now right. so the, the that's that's really the issue um for me on the police department side however there are certain uses that an electric vehicle would work the disadvantage is that if one vehicle goes down this electric vehicle may not be the vehicle that needs to be replacing it so the versatility of having a fleet that's similar in abilities is there's a lot for the police department but not for public works or for the town hall if it, if it works then uh, we'll have to come back to you later on to see uh, how it fits in the budget and what it's going to replace okay. is it going to replace you know, mileage to personnel, and can we show that we are generating right. that much? We have data. Uh, you know, right. at this price, it's really doesn't take too many trips to the post office to pay for itself. But in the future, when there are when the subsidies are gone, uh, that's a whole different story. So we, we just have to look at it, and one day at a time on this one. I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm struggling with buying these a little bit because I'm, I'm just I'm really n nervous about what's next. Uh, the charging stations don't scare me because there's enough electric vehicles in town. I believe they would be used. But people run in here for 5, 10, 15 minutes. They're not in here for two hours. So, you know, to plug into the charging station, and unless they were coming to a meeting or a planning board meeting or a council meeting that they have an item on or something, I, I don't see people plugging in as frequently as, you know, just, just to plug in. So um, we'll see. And then, again, we have the um, – Farmers market here all all uh, summer, so maybe uh, some of the some of those folks would be plugging in. I don't know. I, I'm a, I think it's a great idea for the um, uh, for the company to be doing this because I think it gets people over the hump of at least trying this to see if the yeah. technology fits into your lifestyle and work style. And I think for us, it it probably does. So it'd be nice to have a test drive without. You know, without having to commit long term to this, so I'm really looking for feedback from the employees and looking for feedback from the police department to see, you know, the pros and cons. And you know, without trying it, they really, you know, they they really can't tell. So I think it's I think it's a good idea, and the price is right. I just had one more sort of comment, and it's really um, more of an editorial comment, not really related to this, but in general, people who drive environmentally responsible vehicles have the environment in mind and 
we're putting all this emphasis on electricity, and yet most of our electricity does not come from responsibly sourced power. Now, I'm, I'm connecting some dots here. Mo m most of the people I know who are environmentally conscious and are maybe Prius drivers are opposed to the New England Energy Corridor Connect CMP power line project. And, w and I've spoken to a number of people who don't realize because they say, oh, that energy's going to Massachusetts. Well, all of New England buys their energy at the same price. We're in a consortium, the New England Energy Consortium. And so when Massachusetts gets clean energy because it's mandated by their, their voters, it doesn't just, it's not exactly a pass through. But, and I'm not saying I'm for it one way or another. I understand the environmental concerns. And I one day will think I'm one day one way, and one day I think I'm another a way. But I just find it there's a little bit of irony here with the environmental movement to drive electric cars, yet oppose clean hydropower from a from a non carbon source. So that's just my little editorial comment on that. I just want people to think about that. So, not to take sides, but just to further muddy the waters. Well, or the, inform me. It, it, is, it is not clean hydropower up there. That, that dam was a ecological disaster in the making, and it's the, the fact that we're getting power from the dam, yes, it, it's it's is power is just not going to carbon. Away. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. it, it's yeah. but it, the 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 way that dam was built and the the miles and acreage that it used up is right. is anything but clean. But um, so there's there's a little bit more to that story. But um, we'll have to discuss. The whole that. idea of going to an electric grid is is by using solar and wind power, offshore wind, uh, and to a less to a lesser degree, hydropower. Right, that, right. That is, that is environmentally friendly. Right. So, so we're not, we're not there yet. No, we got, but well, we're right all, all your municipal buildings now are being generated, are being supplied by, you know, one solar field. Right. So, you, I mean, you're, you're walking the walk and talking the talk. So don't, don't beat yourself up too badly. I think uh, we are doing some very, very good things in our community that right. uh, we should be very proud of. So. Right. And I'm just hoping, too, that this charging system can be powered by our solar farm, which I'm sure it can. So, I mean, it, it kind of is setting an example. I mean, right. here we are. We're a small town. We have our own solar farm. We're going in this step trying to be green. And I think it might even be a good idea that, you know, this vehicle owned by the town of Cumlin as a test pilot. I mean, it, you know, it, it's kind of a no-lose situation. You can't lose. I mean, the lease is very, very cheap. I mean, I think I'd be tempted to take one myself, and, I, and I'm a gearhead, you know. I mean, but the friend of mine that had bought the new Tesla is in the heat pump business, and he said the technology in those in the last 10 years has advanced so fast, he said that the automobile will be three times faster than those. And I think he's right, because one of the gentlemen that was in cahoots with Tesla has been now bought out and gone to work for General Motors, and General Motors is claiming by the year 2040 that they will have completely electric vehicles. So I do think it's closer than we think it is. I mean, you know, and I thought I'd never see it, but I think it's coming, so. But I think it's, it's worth trying. I agree. George, anything? Just God help the internal combustion engine as well. <laughs> I'll still fix it, George. <laughs> <laughs> what are we going to do with all those? All those uh, they're going to have to you retrofit do, them. You, you see all. pieces left laying around. Shirley and I at least have gone halfway. You know, you're on a hybrid, right? No, not yet. Not yet. So I'm, I'm there. <laughs> Allison, how about you? Anything? No, I, I 
listened on the lands and conservation committee so so yeah i think um it, it's a no-brainer so i think it makes sense and i think it would be a good thing that every, everybody on the council at least took a test ride in Absolutely. this thing i mean seriously because I mean, I was so against these things two months ago, <laughs> and he took me for a ride in this thing, and he says, okay, he says, now we're going to change the programming here, and we're going to go for a, another ride, mm -hmm. and it was unbelievable. I mean, it's it's an eye-opener, it really is, I mean, so. I was going to say, it might be a good road, you know, stand in for a police car for that quick zero to 60. You don't They're pretty, it's instant power. <laughs> Speaking of, can't crash these. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I tell you how fast the Tesla is, but there's a police officer yeah. in the back. <laughs> we had, uh, like it was mentioned a couple times here, uh, that the Lands and Conservation uh, Commission actually supported uh, the uh, purchase of this uh, this uh, electric vehicle. So, yes. just wanted to say that and. Mike Schwent. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Anything? Can we have a motion? I'll give you the motion, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I move to authorize the town manager to execute a lease agreement with Hyundai Capital America for the lease of two electric vehicles at a very reasonable rate. <laughs> Ron, put that one in. <laughs> second. You got a second? Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, Brenda. Thank you. The next item is to set a public hearing date. Uh, a date to uh, consider and act on a class one liquor license for Rachel's on the Green for the period of, uh, of November, excuse me, of March 29th through March 29th, 2002. 22. 22, I'm sorry. Mr. Town Manager. Um, staff is recommending that we set the public hearing date for February 22nd. Public discussion, anybody? No? Okay, uh, do we have a motion? Ron? Uh, I'll Mr. give Ch you a motion, Tom. Go ahead. Go ahead, George. I move to set a public hearing dated February 22nd to consider an act on the Class 1 liquor license renewal for Rachel's on the Green for a period of March 29th, 2021 to March 29th, 2022. Thanks. Second. Ron, second. Further discussion? All in favor? Unanimous, Brenda. The uh, next item is new business. And I'm going to tell you the Finance Committee is going to be very, very busy. We uh, will have um, starting March 1st at 5.30. It's not a council meeting. Monday and the next item next day would be the next date would be uh, Monday March 8th the next date would be uh, March tw uh, 15th at 530 and there's a, that is also not a council meeting the uh, next date would be uh, uh, Monday uh, this 22nd at 530 next date would be um, Monday uh, um, the 29th and it's not as that that is also a uh, not a council meeting and then and then we'll wrap it up we we'll have one more after this uh, Monday April 5th it's not a council meeting date and then uh, we will wrap it up on Saturday uh, April 10th beginning at uh, at uh, I think it was at 8 o'clock 
and it will be, um, we'll stay with it until uh, it's complete. Okay, um, anything else? Um, new business? Ron, I'm going to start with you tonight. Just a couple of things. Um, condolences to the Foster family. I mean, Herb Foster, who's been a resident of this town for a long, long time. I can remember my grandmother talking way, way back, and I don't even know the year, that she used to go to Herb's house to pay the taxes in the town of Cumberland. And I mean, this is way back. I mean, he's just been a genuine family. I mean, and it is just a great guy. I mean, great family. They've been here for a long time, got deep roots in the community. And then I was very surprised in Sunday's paper, Janine Gorham's son passed away. I want to give her condolences to her, a very young man, and uh, sorry for her loss. And I have $20 from our good friend Dean for the food pantry and my $20. And I want to get people to keep donating. Bill Stiles wants me to keep this rolling. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. Thanks, Ron. Thanks. George? I just want to reiterate what Ron said about Herb Foster and offer my condolences to his wife and to the family. Um, to put a little perspective on it, Ron, I was in high school in the early 60s, and Herb had been around a long time yeah. then. <laughs> so it doesn't take a lot to add up the numbers, but I'm not sure. What, what, how old was he? 90? 91. 91? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, that's all I have. Allison? Well, thank you. It just um, clearly I'm, a, I am, I'm married into this wonderful foster family, and um, Herb was always, always there with a smile and a hug, so he will definitely be missed. And um, I know they're doing visiting hours on Thursday, um, but they'll do a, once we can all kind of, be together in a, a true celebration of everything that, that Herb was because he was definitely a lot builder, diehard Greeley girls basketball <laughs> fan, um, fireman, uh, veteran. So, so yeah, lot, lots to celebrate in that way. Thanks, Alice. Um, the, uh, the food pantry, we had, uh, we served uh, 60, uh, folks uh, this past week we also um, I do want to uh, reach out to the uh, again to the uh, um, the volunteers that we have the tie that I'm wearing today it came from Madeline Young and uh, Roger was one of my best friends and he's, he's been gone for a little while so but uh, again I'd like to uh, thank Madeline for the uh, the tie the uh, Planning board meets uh, what next week, so we'll uh, anxiously see what they have to say. Bob, I'll have to mention Herb too. Uh, uh, Herb's wife uh, was just as important in this community, and uh, um, Herb was in the Lions Club with us and served for uh, a lifetime. You know, his wife was always in the kitchen, and uh, they were just devoted to this community, devoted to public service. Uh, the, it's an endless list. They were, they're both missed. Uh, uh, they were uh, they were great people. Uh, and another uh, interesting note of a man passing is uh, Fred Jensen, uh, his obituaries, and and he uh, started uh, Ledgewood uh, Assisted Living down on. Uh, Route one, uh, did a great job. Thanks, Bob. Shirley? Well, I'll echo my condolences and my memories. I grew up hearing about Herbie, Herbie Foster, that's what he was called, back in the 60s and 70s, and he was a younger man, and he really set the bar high for town clerks in our community because that's what he was for decades. Um, and luckily, we've only had, I think, Tammy might only be our fourth town clerk since him. Christine St. Peter, and then 
Nadine, North. Nadine, <coughs> Nadine and Tammy. Nadine and now Tammy. So, yeah. yeah. Clara, Clara Norton. Clara yeah. Norton. Oh, that's right, Clara. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, and then Hope used to be a substitute teacher. So, you know, they really did embody the community and still continue through their sons to embody um, the essence of community. Uh, the library committee meeting last month was postponed. There wasn't a lot of business, so it was decided they're still meeting remotely and business is kind of slow at the library. Um, people should still call and request books if they're interested. I did it for the first time since the pandemic. I can't tell you how much money I've spent on books, so I decided to give the library a try again, and they were very accommodating. And the nicest feature I have, I like, is being able to download books from the Maine State Library and listen to those. And so um, that's a great resource for the public. The Bicentennial Committee meets tomorrow night, Wednesday night. They are very busy, and Thomas is busy with them from the library, identifying pictures, getting uh, virtual slideshows ready to help celebrate um, our bicentennial, which kicks off in a month. Uh, the new books are in. I actually saw one. I actually touched one. Thomas offered to let me borrow it, and I didn't dare. I didn't, you know, I'm, re I've got, I'm ready with my order, and uh, I'm going to wait like everyone else to, to get started on that. Um, and I think that's all I have for tonight, Ms. Gail. Thank you. Thank you, Shirley. Bill, you have anything else? Awesome. You're all set. Um, do we have a motion for adjournment? Bob? I move. Second? We have a second? Ron? Second. All in favor? Unanimous, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for watching in tonight. We do appreciate it. Thank you. One thing, speaking of town clerk and Herb, 